hey, it's Dylan with Bible A to Z. So we are in Genesis chapter 4 today. We had previously looked at Genesis chapter 3, which was the fall. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they not only sinned, but they brought sin into the world. And we are still dealing with the effects of that today with a fallen world, sickness, struggles, pain, all of that stuff because of the sin of Adam and Eve. Now, as we get into chapter 4, we will see their two sons, Cain and Abel, how they were then in this world filled with sin and how one of them chose to honor God and the other one chose to dishonor God. So if you have a Bible, you can look with us in chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, The man was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have a male child with the Lord's help. She also gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of flocks, but Cain worked the ground. In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious, and he looked despondent. So we see at the start that Adam and Eve were able to have some kids, Cain and then Abel, and they both chose different courses of career. One was a shepherd of the flocks, one was a farmer, and there's nothing intrinsically good or bad about either of those jobs. They're both fine. None, neither of them are a job that you would say automatically is a sinful thing. Um, because ultimately a job, it's not necessarily about the job as much as the heart behind it and how the person is using it to glorify God. So they both go into these two different areas of work. And right from the get-go, we see this split that occurs with them. So it says in verse 3, In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. So we see that Cain <clears throat> presented just some of the crops. He just gave some of the stuff. Whereas Abel gave the firstborn. He was giving the best to God. And so with this, we see that Cain is giving the very best that he can offer in their fat portions. And then it says, as a result, the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. So this wasn't just some trivial, I'm just going to choose to um, accept this one and not that one. It was the heart that was behind it. There was uh, faith on the part of Abel, and there was unbelief on the part of Cain. And because of that, that's why their um, sacrifices were accepted and rejected. So here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he sp still speaks through his faith. So Abel presented God this offering, not just as a something to check off of a list, not as a duty that he had to fulfill, but he gave it to God through faith. He gave God his very best. And what kind of a lesson should that be for us that we should not think of just giving God our leftovers? So often people want to think that they're honoring God by giving him a $20 bill in the offering plate or something when God's not as concerned about the dollar amount or whatever, although not to say that's not something to look at, but he's not as concerned about that at all as the heart with which we give. If we are giving grudgingly $20, or, you know, cheerfully $10. He would rather us give cheerfully. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. And Abel was giving his firstborn, but he was not doing it with a sorrowful face. He was very happy to give what God had given to him. Because that's ultimately what giving is, is um, sometimes we think, well, how much of my money will I let God have? When really we have it reversed. It's how much of God's money should I keep? Because God is the one who's entrusted with us the time, talents, money, resources, relationships that we have, and we should use those in a God-honoring way. So you can give to God whatever you have or whatever you are, 
but the the key factor is is that it must be given in faith that the bible talks about how god is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him we have to come to him in faith hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says and without faith it is impossible to please god impossible to please god without faith so abel's coming to god through faith cain was not so like i said these were both godly occupations um, between a, a farmer and a, a shepherd, neither one on the surface is better or worse than the other. Now, I've heard some Christians who have said that the type of sacrifice was the reason, or at least one of the reasons why the sacrifice was accepted or rejected by God, because they say that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins and such. And so they point to this as kind of a picture of Christ. And obviously, without Jesus Christ shed blood on the cross, nobody is forgiven of any sins. But I do have a problem with that interpretation just because of the context that we see in here. So for starters, there is no mention of this being a sacrifice for sins. There's no mention of that at all. In fact, the sacrificial system hadn't even been set up yet. So there was no requirements that we see in the Bible of how God wanted them to bring a sacrifice to God. Because keep in mind, once the sacrificial system was put in place, it it was also including a grain offering in which you do give from the produce of the land. But this, in this case, doesn't necessarily say at all whether this is a sin offering or a, a thanks offering, any type of differentiation by the type of offering that's being done sacrificial system hadn't been set up yet in the first place so that would lead one to suspect that the reason why these sacrifices were accepted or rejected depending on the person was not because of the type as much as the faith behind the sacrifice one gave just whatever they wanted to give from the land that was Cain And one gave the firstborn of their flock, gave the very best, and that was Abel. And because of that, their sacrifices were accepted. So we see from here that Abel was doing the right thing, but Cain, he was kind of living up to 2 Timothy 3.5, which says, "...holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people." So that he was holding on to a form of godliness by thinking, well, I'm just going to offer something to God and he'll be just thankful that I'm giving him something instead of giving God his very best. So unlike a human observer where ultimately all we can see is surface level. Now, for some people, we can maybe take a guess if it seems like their motivations were split or ungodly or whatever, but there's a lot of people who can fool us into thinking they're doing something for the right reason when behind the surface they're just doing it to have the praise of men or the sense of accomplishment or whatever. People can fool us, but people can't fool God. It says this in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So the Lord is able to just see straight through all the lies and the deceit and all of the um, charade that sometimes we can play with God of trying to do a form of godliness, thinking that we're going to fool everybody, including God. That's not going to fly. God sees exactly through to not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it. So he's weighing the condition of the human heart. He's looking at Abel's. And, and keep in mind, even Abel, With giving the firstborn of the flock, if he had given God the firstborn like he did right here, but he's giving it grudgingly, he's giving it with a clenched fist, angry at God, would God be happy with Abel at that point? Would he have accepted gladly that offering? Of course not. It wasn't just the offering. It was the heart that Abel brought as well. So elsewhere, Scripture shows that the Lord requires of the giver an obedient and upright heart. So it says this in Hosea 6, verse 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So God is looking for the right heart, and this is something that Cain did not have, 
it says in Jude chapter 1, verse 11, I say chapter 1, but there's only one chapter in the book, but it says this in Jude 11, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. They have gone the way of Cain. So what is the way of Cain? The way of Cain that these people he, uh, Jude was alluding to were going was a, having a dead religion, this form of godliness, trying to have the outward appearance of a quote-unquote very religious person and not having the Spirit guiding and directing their life, not being led by God's Word, but by empty religion, which eventually led to jealousy and from that persecution of those that were godly and a murderous intent is how we see it play out in Cain's life. But it began by this trying to put on this facade of religious expression when his heart was far from God. And we still see this today. People can go to, and there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, I've done it in my life. It's it's great if you're doing it with the right heart. But sometimes, you know, there's going to be people in church that they just raise their hand and worship, which is good if you're doing it with the right heart. But sometimes maybe people are doing it just to be seen by others. And, and if they're doing it just so people think, wow, they're a really great Christian. Look at how they're worshiping. If that's the intent, then that's going to the way of Cain, which Jude 11 was talking about, a vain, empty religion. You're doing stuff just to be seen. You're doing stuff to go through the motions instead of the heart behind it. So Jude 11 warns of the way of Cain, and it also tells us that many Christians are worried about all kinds of things when really they should be checking themselves first and foremost. So nowadays... Understandably, um, many Christians are well aware of atheism and how oftentimes in the public school system that can be taught and propagated and try to be endorsed. And so as a result, we try to instill the fact that this is wrong, that God is the creator and, and he's the one who gives us morality. Why we know right and wrong is through a creator God. But as a result, sometimes people forget that it's not just atheism we have to be aware of, but vain, empty religion as well. This thought of, if I just go to any church or any religion, it all leads to the same place. If I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, or if I don't even call myself a Christian, we're all going to heaven. That would be the vain, empty religion of Cain. If you just believe what you want to believe, and as long as you believe it sincerely enough, then God will accept you as you are. Just give him you know, your leftovers. He'll be thankful to get what you give. All of that stuff is unbiblical, and it leads us further away from God instead of closer to God. So in verse 5, it says this in the second part, Cain was furious, and he looked despondent. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious, and why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So the illustration here about sin crouching at the door, the sin that had already occurred with Cain, he's now compounding it by now getting furious, angry at God, angry at Abel, jealous. He's letting his you know thoughts probably stir in his mind of, all the wrong stuff that Abel's done in his life, why his, you know, and he's just letting this stuff go over him. And as a result, it's getting him more and more despondent, further away from God. And the, if you look in it, it's talking about sin crouching at the door. Sin is just like, it's kind of given in this verse as a wild animal that isn't going to be tamed. That's just seeking to devour us. And if we let it, it will, you know, it's kind of like, Sometimes you'll, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen these videos. Sometimes I'll randomly watch YouTube videos or whatever. And it'll show like a Russian guy who has like two huge grizzly bears as pets. Or, you know, stuff like that. Or somebody who has like lions or tigers as their pets. And that might be neat for a little bit. But nobody would really be shocked if that owner ended up dying because those are wild animals. And as much as you can try, you can't really tame a grizzly bear or a tiger or a lion. And even if you tame it 99% of the time, if it breaks loose just one time and gets upset about one thing one time, 
it's game over for you. And sometimes people play with fire in the same way with their sin. They kind of go, oh, you know, it's not a big deal. I think I got it. I don't need to worry about it. But the fact is, is you might think you're doing okay, but be careful how you walk lest you stumble. You know, pride comes before destruction. And if we're not mindful of the fact that sin is seeking to devour us every day, then we're not coming into the battle prepared. We have a spiritual battle. The Bible talks about how we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and we wrestle against the principalities, the rulers uh, in the heavenly places. And with that, it's a knowledge to know that we're in a fight and to know that God is greater, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But that doesn't mean we just sit back and rest on our laurels. We have to go ready to be um, clothed in the armor of God for the battle ahead. Cain was not ready for that. And as a result, he fell deeper and deeper into his sin. So in verse 8, it says, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So we see here that Cain's jealousy and anger at God and himself and Abel, it's now compounding. It's getting more and more vicious. So this wasn't just a, a crime of passion that he had not expected to do. You can see that he th thought through his actions beforehand, which makes them even worse. Uh, he invites his brother out to the field. Hey, come out here. I need some help with something. Just It'll just take a little bit of time. So he makes sure that he's in a secluded place where nobody can hear him. And then he kills his own brother. And he lured Abel in there for the intention of killing him. And that is one of the things with sin left unchecked. Now, our sin might not lead to murder, but our sin left unchecked will continue to grow and continue to um, become more manifest in our life if we do not seek God's help, if we don't repent. You know, instead of him repenting, he got furious, and then he just kept adding to it. When we are in sin, we need to repent and, and move away from it. This reminds me of 1 John chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, where it says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So the reason why this sin occurred once again, it says because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So the deeds that they were doing, one was righteous, one was evil. And we might be thinking, well, I'm not a murderer. But in this passage, and then also with Jesus speaking about if we have hate in our heart, it's the same as murder. That God's going to judge us not just by our actions, but by the thoughts of our heart by the desires that we are thinking and things of that nature, which should point us all the more to our need for a Savior, that even on our best day, the best 15 minutes of our life, we still need a Savior to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So verse 9 then says, The Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's guardian? So God never asked questions because he needs an answer in the Bible. Anytime God asks a question in the Bible, it's not for his benefit, but it's for our benefit. It's kind of like sometimes when a teacher asks a question, it's not because they don't know, but they're trying to have the student see if the student knows what's going on. And so God's trying to get Cain to admit what he has done. He says, where's your brother Abel? And instead of confessing and repenting then, he, he says, I don't know, am I my brother's guardian or my brother's keeper? You know, it's not my job to look after him. And so he's trying to divert responsibility as if I have no clue. And just a side note, it's never a good idea to try to lie to God. You know, I think he, he uh, definitely knows what's going on there. So Cain thought he was pulling a fast one. He was going to lie to God. Doesn't work out. And it doesn't work out for us when we try to hide things from God either. 
So continuing on in verse 10, it says, Then he said, What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed, alienated from the ground that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood you have shed. If you work the ground, it will never again give you its yield. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. So we see that after Adam sinned, one of the punishments that God gave to Adam was now the ground was going to grow thorns and thistles and it was going to be hard work for the fruit and vegetables and things like that to grow, but it would still grow. But then he tells Cain, because of your sin and the blood of your brother that cries out to me, the the ground will never again shed any uh any uh, yield any produce for you so now he's telling this farmer Cain there will never again be any produce that's yielded from the ground that you work so it's kind of a step up from now previously what happened with his dad Abel or uh, Adam he says it's going to be hard work to get the the fruit from the ground now he's telling Cain there's not going to be anything that comes for you you might be a farmer by trade, but you're going to have to learn a new trade because of your sin. Okay, starting in verse 13, it says, But Cain answered the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Since you are banishing me today from the face of the earth, and I must hide from your presence, and I become a restless wanderer on the earth, whoever finds me will kill me. So now Cain, he's not, he still is not repentant. He's still not thinking about the wrong that he did. He killed his own brother. He disobeyed God, dishonored God, sinned against God, all these things. He's not even concerned about that. He's not at all thinking about his sin. He's now, the first thing he's thinking about is me. And he's saying, well, this is too much for me to bear. And he's more focused on the punishment rather than the sin that led to the punishment. He was more focusing on um, the consequence and not the reason that the consequence came, came in the first place. So he was still showing a hardness of heart even after all these things. So then finally it says, Then the Lord replied to him, In that case, whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And he placed a mark on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. Then Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden." So whatever this was, how it, whether it was a word or just a mark, or somehow it's a mark that people intrinsically, God puts it upon their heart to know this mark means do not touch Cain, the Bible doesn't say. All it says is that God put a mark on Cain, and people knew when they looked at that that he was not to be killed because there might have been an urge or desire to take his life. God had once again shown mercy that Cain didn't deserve by sparing his life here and allowing him to live. And then finally, we'll go to verse 17. It says this, Cain was intimate with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain became the builder of a city, and he named the city Enoch after his son. Irad was born to Enoch. Irad fathered Mahujael. Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. Lamech took two wives for himself, one named Ada and the other named Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of the nomadic herdsmen. His brother was named Jubal. He was the father of all who played the lyre and the flute. Zillah bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Pay attention to my words, for I killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is to be avenged seven times over, then for Lamech it will be seventy-seven times. Adam was intimate with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has given me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. A son was born to Seth also, and he named him Enosh. At that time people began to call on the name of the Lord." So in this last little bit, we see that God grants Adam and Eve another child, and presumably they had more even after Seth. But Seth was an important uh, person because through Seth's lineage would come the Messiah, and Adam or uh, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and all of them would come through um, the line of Seth. And in this passage that we read about, we see how 
the descendants of Cain were very prosperous. You know, there was all kinds of prosperity. There was um, people who were great at musicians. And um, it says here in verse 21, his brother was named Jubal. He was the father of all who play the lyre and the flute. So he was probably maybe one of the first or the first to have these musical instruments and to use them. Uh, we see in verse 20, going back a verse, the father of all the nomadic herdsmen. So he maybe was a prosperous shepherd with lots of sheep enclosures, keeping a good track of everything. Verse 22, um, Tubal Cain made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. So now it's not just working with your hands or maybe with sticks, but he's now fashioning tools together to help, you know, maybe chop a tree down or, uh, uh, dig in the soil to better harvest uh, things like that. And so we're seeing prosperity, financially at least probably, of many of Cain's descendants. But all of that doesn't really matter if those descendants were not following after the things of God. And as a parent, if your kids go and become doctors or lawyers or you know live in big houses, that's all great. But if they're not walking with Jesus Christ, then that is, that's a loss. You know, if we are basically shepherding our children in such a way that they are doing all the earthly things that lost people are doing with no real intention of genuine growth in Christ. Yeah, maybe they go to church occasionally. Maybe they read their Bible once in a while. But we need to really instill in ourselves and then in those around us that, Money comes and goes, and you know, prominence and prosperity, all that stuff can come and go. But our relationship with Christ is eternal. And Cain's lineage, they have much financial prosperity in this passage. It seems to point to them being creative, and likely from that creativity, um, they might have made some money. But if they weren't following God, then that wasn't. Uh, a good trade at all. So then we get to Lamech. It talks about this descendant named Lamech, who was the first person to go against the, what the Bible said about a man, a woman. He now has two wives. And this is an ongoing issue, <clears throat> especially in the Old Testament, with people taking multiple wives. <clears throat> and these wives would oftentimes prove to be a big problem in the lives of these families because these men would choose to have multiple wives. It would all obviously bring with it jealousy and just all kinds of extra problems in the household with um, going against how God had made this mandate. But in this story, Lamech, he's bragging about this guy wounds him, you know, maybe punches him or something. And so as a retaliation, he just kills him. And this goes to the fact of, like, nowadays, we don't necessarily think about it in this way, but whenever we talk about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the reason why that was set up in the first place was so that you could say an eye for an eye. So if somebody was to punch you, quote-unquote, then you would have, like, the freedom to punch them back and if it was, like, mandated in the court of law. So if, like, somebody killed somebody, then they would it would be justifiable to put that person to death. But it wouldn't be right if somebody was to, like, take one of your sheep and then now you get put to death type of thing. So an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was trying to go against what Lamech was doing, which was for a smaller offense, then going to the maximum, which was killing this other person. He's bragging about, basically, if Cain was to be avenged seven times, I'm greater than Cain, I should be avenged 77 times because I'm this amazing person. And so we see all the way back in in Genesis 4 that there is this descent into sin. That after Adam and Eve sinned, it was like a snowball effect that took place very quickly with now Cain and Abel, Cain kills his own brother. Then later on, they have a descendant, Lamech. He's the first one that's recorded that takes multiple wives. He kills a man for striking him. And the world just continues to find new ways to sin. It finds new ways to go against the things of God. And if we aren't grounded in God's word and in prayer and praise and worship, then we are going to be more and more susceptible to giving in to the temptations that Satan will throw at us. So with this, we see 
that in spite of the sin of Cain, God was still merciful to him by letting him live, putting a mark upon him to keep him alive so that other people wouldn't kill him. And we should be thankful as well that when we sin and we deserve hell, God made a way available so that we could go to heaven through what Jesus did for us on the cross so that we could be forgiven of past, present, and future sins, not because we're good, <clears throat> but because he's good. And so I hope that this lesson was a good overview of Genesis chapter 4, and I hope you can be with us uh, next time. So until then, hope you have a good one.